y'all, it's me, Sandy Peterson. Do you like werewolf movies? To be frank, they're not really my favorite. I guess because I'm pretty big on tentacle monsters like this shows. But a good werewolf can be fun. In this video, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of werewolf films and list some good ones for you to check out. Now, the first ever good werewolf movie was The Werewolf of London, immortalized by Warren Zevon in one of the greatest rock songs of all time. In this film, a botanist finds the rare moon lily in Tibet. Now, the juice from this lily, which only blossoms under the full moon, can cure or at least hold off lycanthropy. Interestingly, this has two werewolves, and they're fighting over the moon lily. So that's pretty great. The werewolf makeup is pretty minor, but what do you expect from 1935? Of course, the movie that really started werewolves was 1941, The Wolfman, in which Lon Caney Jr. basically created all the werewolf lore that we know today. The idea that only silver kills them, that they only transform on the full moon, and that Wolfsbane has something to do with it, have echoed through later movies. Incidentally, Wolfsbane is normally called Monk's Hood in English. This is a really poisonous plant growing in mountainous areas like the Haunted Harts Mountains of Germany. I think it grows in America too. It's so deadly that in the old days, they would rub Wolfsbane juice on javelins and arrows to kill prey. Despite the name, it's not just deadly to wolves. I mean, it'll totally kill humans. I can say that in The Wolfman, they never really totally explain what connection Wolfsbane has, except that the werewolf only transforms in that movie during the full moon when the Wolfsbane blooms, which is mid to late summer, for example. This means that following this rule would mean werewolves can only cause trouble on these nine days in 2023. If you're interested in finding out if the dog bite you got last month could have been a werewolf, and you're kind of hoping to see that you become one. Now, this whole full moon thing is kind of unsatisfying if you want your werewolf to transform at will, but it's also cool to have people not want to transform and have to, so I have mixed emotions about it. In my role-playing games and adventures, what I normally do is I say that werewolves over time can learn to change at will, but that all werewolves must change during the full moon, whether or not they want to. This is mostly so my evil werewolves can change when I need it for a cool scene or an encounter, and so a good guy forced into werewolfism is forced to change at certain times and, you know, cause trouble. Now, there's one feature of the movie The Wolfman that has not been enforced in future films, namely that the werewolf sees an image of a pentacle in the palm of his next victim. I mean, this is a problem if you want a werewolf going on a random rampage or meet someone by chance. It just doesn't work that well for games or even movies, so it's no wonder it got dropped. Anyway, if you haven't seen The Wolfman, it's, uh... Pretty fun, and probably better than you might expect. It's full of really, really good actors. It's not super gory, but it's also not as slow-moving and stagey as the original Dracula. Well, I would say it's also not as good as the original Frankenstein. I'd say it's about on a par with the original Mummy movie with with uh, Boris Karloff. Anyway, there's my review of Wolfman. Now, what about other werewolf movies? Now, I know you guys all think I'm going to pick a bunch of boldy old movies based on what I've done so far, but I'm not. You see, one of the major important parts of any werewolf movie is the awesome transformation scene. And really, this couldn't be done convincingly before the 1980s. So, from The Wolfman in 1941, we're going to jump clear up to the 1980s. In 1981, The Howling was released, and it had some really intense scenes. Early on, a reporter is investigating a sex murder. That's how the whole thing starts. In fact, one of the reasons I liked The Howling is that historical werewolf murders were overwhelmingly sex crimes. Yes, they're historical werewolf murders. Were they real werewolves? Well, if you're being raped and murdered by a guy who thinks he's a wolf, I'm not sure it really matters. Anyway, they get the sex tied in nicely, and eventually they find a whole community of werewolves. It's a great werewolf movie and one of my favorites. It did spawn like seven sequels but I don't recommend any of those. My next film is also from 1981, and it's technically not a werewolf movie at all. It's called The Wolfen, and it's about a species of canine predator somewhat resembling wolves, which is as intelligent as humans. They live in urban areas, like in the movie, they're in New York, and they prey upon the homeless. They hide in plain sight by looking like dogs, going around at night, and being super fast and smart. Anyway, the protagonists gradually find out about the wolfen and their abilities, and terror ensues. It's a film in the sadly rare category of thinking horror. If you don't mind having to reason out what's going along with the heroes, I powerfully recommend The Wolfen. 2002 brought us Dog Soldiers, an excellent film from the UK, which has the bonus of featuring one of my favorite actors, Sean Pertwee. He's a fine action star. You may recognize him as the Gotham TV series Alfred Pennyworth. He's the toughest of all bathrooms, Alfred's by far. Even more important, Sean is the son of John Pertwee, another actor I love, if only because he was one of the best doctors in Doctor Who. The bottom line is, if you want to see tough British soldiers trying to deal with werewolves, 
Dog Soldiers is the film for you. That's my kind of short list of recommended werewolf films. You might be surprised at some of the films I've left off, like American Werewolf in London or Joe Johnston's all-star version of The Wolfman in 2010, but trust me, I have my reasons. Now I want to move to another topic, the greatest werewolf actor of all time. That's right. Paul Nashi. So Nashi started out as a bodybuilder. I mean, he's a pretty buff guy. And uh, he wrote a story. He wanted to do a werewolf movie. And he scripted it and got it ready to go. And uh, the Spanish censors said that his werewolf couldn't be Spanish because they were fascist, kind of. I mean, they were phalangists, right? And they said, you can't have Spaniards be werewolves. So he had to rename, make it be a Polish werewolf. So his name was Waldemar Daninsky. And then he wanted to get Lon Chaney Jr. to come be in his movie in 1968. But Lon Chaney was kind of old and drunk and he didn't come. And so Paul Nashi had to be the werewolf. Now, Paul Nashi is actually able to act. He's buff. He's not super tall, so he doesn't have the looming presence of Lon Chaney, but he does his best. Uh, he played Valdemar Daninsky as kind of an anti-hero in 12 different movies. Now, he was a kid in the Spanish Civil War, and he's, and apparently the things that happened then kind of affected him. I'm not sure how much affected him. I think he was like five years old when it ended. He saw Frankenstein vs. the Wolfman when he was 11, and he said it was a life-changing experience. In addition to playing a werewolf, he also played the mummy... Dracula, the Frankenstein monster, the devil, Jack the Ripper, ghosts, hunchbacks, all kinds of things. He was in movies ranging from post-apocalypse exploitation to brain transplants. For a long time, it was hard to find his movies, but it's getting easier. And so his approach to the world is kind of interesting. You see, Walter Martinsky isn't exactly a bad guy. Um, he lives kind of away, but he doesn't try to lock himself up when he turns into the Wolfman. He just goes out and, you know, wreaks havoc. He just kills innocent people all the time. And so, in the movie you're watching him, you're kind of sympathetic to Valdemar Dinsky, but you kind of like, he has to be destroyed. It's a similar approach if you've seen the, what I think, excellent vampire movies, Blackula. And uh, I think Scream, Blackula Scream is the sequel. In these, there's a really good actor, William Marshall, playing a vampire. And uh, the name is Blackula. I can't do anything about that. The thing is, William Marshall is basically like a good guy, kind of. I mean, he's a vampire, but he's, you know, not as villainous as he could be. But he starts spreading vampirism and he makes more and more vampires. And they spread more. And there's this huge plague of vampires. And none of the other ones are good like him. So you realize that even though you like William Marshall and you don't want Blackula to die, he's got to. He's got to go because his existence is causing trouble. The same is true for uh, for Valdemar Dinsky. In Valdemar's movies, he doesn't often make new werewolves. Pretty much he just kills you. And it's really interesting, these movies, because he's an old school wolfman type monster. You can see he has, he's got the, the Lon Chaney look, but there's gore. And there's, there's girls with naked breasts and there's blood dripping off him. He's relentless and really hard to stop. In some of the films, he's particularly hard to stop because they added the detail that he can only be killed by someone who loves him and whom he loves in return. So in those movies, he's always trying to find a sweetheart so she can kill him. That's not true in all the Baltimore Disney movies, but it is in some of them. One of my favorites is um, Dr. Jekyll and the Werewolf. And in this movie, he's the werewolf, and he goes and he finds Dr. Jekyll. Uh, he's actually the son of the original Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Dr. Jekyll has this great plan that he will inject Valdemar with the Hyde formula. And then on the full moon, Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll and the, van and the Wolfman will both emerge at the same time and they'll fight each other and destroy each other and he'll be free. That, that's the doctor's plan. So I'm thinking he's pretty whack because it, the plan works about as well as you'd think it would, which is not well. Now, as he got older, he took a break from movies for a while. Then he came back in because people started realizing this is a great old Spanish horror movie star. In his later years, he wasn't doing the werewolf movies. He did more conventional horror like School Killer, which is a pretty neat haunted building movie. It's an old abandoned school. His last two movies were The Valdemar Legacy Parts 1 and 2. I got these from one of you guys in my comments list who is from Spain and you got them to me. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. The Valdemar Legacy are slow moving kind of stately visions of a magical ritual over time. It's plainly committed and connected to the Cthulhu mythos. And the final scene of the second movie has the genuine article. Unfortunately, in the Valdemar Legacy, Nashi only has a small role, but it's still nice to see him. Perhaps he was ill and he couldn't take on a larger part. We miss you, Paul. And yes, I know your real name was Jacinto. Subscribe like me and buy my goods when you see them to support me. Thank you. Toodaloo!